Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Rogers. My name is Nathan and again we're here with Shadows of Change where we'll be checking out a called Hellbrass, the new FLC legendary hero for a number of different Chaos factions. Naturally, since he is not paid content, I didn't want to put him in the Changeling showcase, but if you're interested, you can get a called Hellbrass completely for free with the following factions. The Changeling, Kairos, Village, Kolek, Sigvald, Archeon, the Demon Prince, and Bellacor. Now, this character is known for melee combat, and that's precisely what he does, and he does it very, very well. So, let's jump into the campaign now and showcase how to unlock him. As one thing Creative Assembly have been doing pretty well with Legendary Heroes recently is having a nice theme to them. So, yeah, let's begin. So, with the Legendary Lords that you're able to unlock him with, you'll be able to get the quest chain at rank 12 with any character. I'm on turn 2 at the moment, but that's because I'm using console commands to be able to level me up a little faster. The first quest will be here with a tale of the true path. You'll get a little bit of description which will focus on character lore to bring you up to speed with who this character actually is. This works perfectly well for people who might not have access to the book or have not checked out lore videos and so on. So word has spread of a noble son, a once great knight of the empire who roams the chaos waste in search of a greater purpose. Most remarkably, he bears the insignia of a Xenshin cult, the brethren of the golden eagle his loyalties had him pursued doggedly for a time by the Templars of Sigmar, the Emperor's Witch Hunters, but once they caught up, he proved his status as the greatest swordsman in his knightly order. Perhaps in time, this champion in the making will make his way to us. But in the meantime, we must ensure there are more like-minded warriors to help him embrace chaos. So obviously a little bit of a change of law here, where the fall is happening now, whereas we know in the story in official law, it actually happened a few years prior, but this makes sense for a game like this. I'm kind of cool with that. And we've got the first quest, which is build a chapter house of knowledge. This will obviously vary on the faction that you end up playing, because this is for the Xenshian Monogod faction for the Changeling, but... Yeah, it's simple enough. The next part of the quest isn't too bad either, it's literally just recruit 8 units and maintain them, so this would be Chaos Warriors of Zinch, Chaos Warriors of Zinch with Halberds, or Chaos Knights of Zinch. There's a current of 8, you can have these in between different armies, as far as I've been able to see at least, and you can get these fairly early on, it doesn't really take that long to be able to get Chaos Warriors, it's something that you'll realistically start getting within, I want to say 15 turns or so, because that's more or less how I started recruiting them in my own personal playthrough. But we get a little bit more of a description here. The noble breath of the Wandering Knight is carried as a whisper upon the winds. Speaking of a tall monolith, he has encountered deep in the chaos wastes that holds history, magic, and prophecy. Yet standing between the knight and the answers leading him to the chaos embrace is a bloodthirsty doom bull and his war herd. If this warrior is ever to reach his full potential in Zincha's estimations, we must provide him with the assistance he might require to reach the relevations he seeks. So minor rewrites of the official lore, but it does actually bring you some context. I do like this when they do this for legendary heroes. Again, it teaches you about a character, which obviously is always good if it's some big name and you might not know about him. And then after that you get a battle, so you get a little bit of a description. Having Having reached the ancient monolith deep in the waste, the great knight stands on the cusp of learning the truth and completing the path seemingly laid before him, but for one final insurmountable trial. In one-to-one -one combat, the warrior is more than a match for the monolith's Doomball Guardian, but the sheer numbers in the beast's war herd makes the knight's survival nigh on impossible. Zincha's plans may be unknowable, yet your gaze has been drawn to this champion deliberately. It is time to play your part. This is the rewrite, so obviously, again, um, it was just one-on-one, -on -one, but now it's actually a proper full fight. Again, cool, because you end up helping out this character, and it means a bit more, right? So, you just get into the fight there, it's you versus some beastmen you'll be fighting alongside a cold here. Oddly enough, I'm not too sure if this is a bug or not, but there is, doesn't seem to be like an intro cinematic, usually there's a flyover with some talking, but I imagine since he's available to so many different factions, there might not just be a flyover. But we have to talk about the battle itself, so you've got an army, depending on what you bring, a cold has his own army, which isn't really great, you're going to be fighting against two beastmen armies. One of them is going to be full of lots of large monsters, the other one's going to have a decent amount of ongoers, gores, and minotaurs. It can be a little tough depending on the difficulty that you're playing. The battle you're seeing on screen right now is on an easier difficulty due to showcase purposes, and I must say that yes, 
in my own personal campaign, it does get a little harder. I would recommend bringing some Chaos Warriors, which is why that quest actually suggests it. Bring some Anti-Large, you know Chaos Warriors with Halberds are a staple for the Xenchian forces and they definitely do help out here when you're dealing with, you know, Gorgons and Cygors and stuff like that. Because you're going to want to split your forces, I would say. You want to have some support with a called preferably a magic user and again some uh, halberds or anything that's anti-large whilst also taking out this big boy faction right in front of you. Because I can't stress this enough, a called by himself, even with a little bit of support where I had here, I sent over my Furies, my Cockatrice, and obviously uh, the Iridescent Horror to cast some spells. Oh, and the Exalted Flamer of Zinch just to do a little bit more damage. But even then, he was still kind of struggling, which kind of makes sense. It's not supposed to be easy. And by the point that you actually do this in your campaign, I think I did this unlock quest chain around turn 50 or 60 or so during my own personal playthrough. So I had already, you know, better skills. I had a lot more levels up on my characters. So it did become a little easier back then at that point. Plus I was really lucky. I believe I had Manfred for the Changeling's transformation. So yeah, you know, a lot more damage. And if you're going to bring in horror stacks like I did here, you might as well bring the blue scribes in as you'll make them much, much better. So it will actually become a lot easier for you. Now I'll show you the battle here just so you can see how Acold's faction kind of does against one army of beastmen. This should in theory help you decide more or less what units you'll want to bring in. And don't worry, it's timestamps so the battle will play out. We're going to jump into the other stuff if you just decide to skip over. the battle is done and we get a little bit more context here once again going through actual lore where Akol then has to fight a mirror image of himself a younger version of himself too. It's a bit of a shame that a model wasn't created for the battle where you would face the Doombull's armies and then face the other version but I guess that would have made the battle a bit too difficult which you know fair enough these things can't be too complicated or too difficult or else people aren't going to play it or they're going to have to wait until very late into the campaign to actually pick it up which would mean that there's kind of no point because you're already steamrolling at that point but yeah so 
Here you get the choice of different bonuses, so no matter what, you're always going to get a cold, but you get some pretty cool bonuses which can either improve the capabilities of your Chaos Warriors, for all armies this is pretty much per turn, or you can get another bonus which is going to focus on getting immune to psychology for all your characters, charge reflection for all your characters too, Whichever you choose, perfectly fine. At the end of the day, it's depending on your playstyle. And from there, you get the character. He'll instantly spawn, I believe, by your character that did the mission. I did it with the Legendary Lord. And there you go. So the character naturally has his own unique trait, which is called Life Amok, and it's actually fairly decent as you can see on screen, growth plus 25 for local province regardless of ownership, so you can boost up one of your allies if you so wish, casualty replenishment rate plus 5% for armies in region regardless of ownership, I kind of like this because obviously it fits with the whole theming, uh, winds of magic cost minus 20% for lore of life spells, Armies and region regardless of ownership, more benefit to your possible enemies, and enemy leadership minus 8 for enemy armies in local province. I think this is kind of cool. Fits with the theme of Acold, because, I mean, this is what he does, right? So his unique skill line is actually fairly good. You can improve diplomatic relations with pretty much all the Chaos factions, including Chaos Dwarfs here. And there's a few other bonuses too. You'll also be able to get some magical attacks, cooldown reduction, passive ability, weathered thorns. This is for the Chaos Knights and the Doom Knights. Melee damage reflection, which is pretty damn tasty. And you can get the Storm of Renewal, which is a healing spell. This is something that you kind of want anyway, because you don't really get much healing with, well, you barely get any healing for Zinch. So this this is actually a pretty good system. He is a character which is there to heal. It's one of those weird things in law, and it fits him perfectly well. You can also improve the speed of your army, which again, very, very good considering that, yeah, you're mostly running on foot. So having a really fast army is going to make things really interesting for you. And the great thing is you'll also have two unique items, which you'll see on screen. These will be automatically there for him as soon as you unlock him, which makes him quite good at doing a lot of damage, being upfront and personal. I I'm a big fan of this character, I think he was implemented very well, and technically you have a banner bearer because he does have the icon on his back, so yeah, maybe this is for Creative Assembly's way to tell us to shut up about it. Loads of people have been asking for banners to be fair, and I'm one of those. I mean, if Pharaoh can get banner bearers, why can't we? Yes, there's a little bit of jealousy there, but this character is pretty cool because he is a fantastic fighter. Think of him like a Jedi, essentially, because you're going to get a lot of movements. The main thing at the beginning is you're going to get Blade Wind, which is going to be able to do a decent amount of damage. Keep in mind that I'm obviously doing it against some Chaos Warriors of Nuggle, who are going to be quite resistant to damage anyway, but it's a cool animation. The fact is, he moves around really well. He's got great animations in terms of combat. It's nice to see a lot of detail being put into this character. And you can see that when you just watch him get into combat. It's actually quite impressive because there's a lot of animations. There's a lot going on there. You can see him using the sword around. This is kind of why I call them like a Jedi because it's just kind of fun. He's pretty good at killing other characters. Maybe not so much against hordes. Mind you, the Chaos Warriors of Nurgle themselves are very, very strong and very resilient. But it's, it's just great. Honestly, I'm very happy to see it this way. Just the animations themselves make the weight worth it, at least for this character. Again, remember this is an FLC character, he's not attached to the DLC whatsoever, so even if you don't buy the DLC, you'll get your access to him, and if you play as one of the Chaos Factions, you can use him around. It's kind of cool to see him zip around and just do loads of different things, honestly. Very, very impressed. The animation team must have had a lot of fun with him here, and I hope that if we're going to be seeing loads of characters, especially loads of different types of Chaos Warriors, because it kind of makes sense that we'll get one for each of the different monogod factions which means that Archeon is just going to have a blast with all these legendary heroes um yeah I want to see this this detailed I want to see loads of flash I think that's going to be really really cool but what do you guys think about this character let me know your thoughts in the comments below let's start a bit of a discussion I think that this should be the last video for today I'm not too sure which uh schedule I'm going to be releasing them at but once again if you're seeing this and you'd like to know more about the DLC and so on I'll be live on twitch.tv slash the great book of grudges and yeah pop by say hi with all that being said have a good day guys and I'll see you all again very very soon